What's going on, guys? How you doing? Since we're uh, talking about all this music industry stuff, I found this video that I have not watched, and it is none other than Rick Beato. Wow, amazing. If you don't know this guy, you live under a rock. Okay. How corruption and greed led to the downfall of rock music with beard version. Rick Beato. <laughs> Looks good on you, man, but definitely, um, you know, maybe look younger when you shave. <laughs> You're good. You're good. You're good. I'm just joking around. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's get into this. This should be interesting. And Rick Beato, you know, it's great. He makes great videos. Let's check it out. Bam. Okay. This is going to be a really fun video because I'm going to explain to you how corrupt the music business was when I got in it. But it really started back in the mid 90s, around 1996. And it sure, eventually it well led to the demise of rock you. music, but really of most music. Well before that. And this particular corruption happened on so many levels that it's a really convoluted story. So I'm going to have to explain it with a couple other punch-ins to, to get into greater detail so you actually can follow along because you're going to be scratching your head going, wait, what? It's I have Jim Barber industry. here. Jim's been on my channel one time before. Jim, give us a brief history of your of your career. I've done radio promotion. I managed Driving and Crying. I've been a producer, been a publisher, and I was an A&R executive at Geffen during the era we're going to talk about today. But if you want to know more about me, you can read me on Substack. It's called Stars After Stars After Stars, and I'm writing about all of these things. It's in the mm. description. Okay, so we agree on this one thing that, that 1996 was a pivotal year because of the Telecommunications Act that Bill Clinton signed that consolidated radio mm. here in the United States. And essentially two companies, Clear Channel and Cumulus, bought up most of the radio stations. Before that, yeah. you had local stations that would be controlled. Let's say uh, a company might own six stations in a particular area. Mm -hmm. These stations would be supported by local businesses advertising on them. But the, what was the theory in them develop in, in this Communications Act? Well, the original idea before then was you should have local ownership of media and you should have as many different voices as possible. And the people who wanted the Telecommunications Act wanted to say, we'll have more leverage in the marketplace if we have 100 stations. Right. Mm -hmm. What we miss yeah. about pre-1996 was when you only own five or six stations, you have to have individual program directors for every one of the stations you own. And what happened after that passed, when somebody bought 100 stations, corporate America hates duplication and jobs. So they fired all the local program directors and put one person in an office in New York or Atlanta to program all the stations. Okay, so there, you have the program director, which is the, the head of the radio station. You also have DJs. Now, most of the people I've interviewed talk about one station really breaking them. Andy Summers talked about this. There's one station that broke the police. I'll, I'll, pretty much everyone I've interviewed from these huge bands, mm. one station breaks them. It's it's very rare that something just jumps right out. Like a Nirvana jumped out. On, they put the video on MTV and it just blew up and that was it. Well, when you have a mom and pop business, the individual people who work at the radio station, Have the DJs taste. had a lot more influence than they would later when everything's controlled from a corporate headquarters, when everyone's sure. told what to play for their entire shift. When I was playing in a band in the late 90s, I knew people that worked for record labels that lived locally and were radio promotion people for the labels that would go into the stations and the ones like 99X, Leslie Fram. So because they were not owned by Cumulus or Clear Channel at the time, she still had the autonomy to play whatever she wanted and add whatever records she wanted. So they would have a person go in, you'd have 15 minutes or so to give your pitch. They'd have a room full of people and everyone would have their records they would pitch. When I say records, it would be a single of a band. It was a real badge of honor for some of these stations to be the one that found a new artist. Yes. So there was a lot of competition in the community the radio community, people wanted to say, oh, yeah, I discovered this band and it became a hit. Right. So there was a real motivation for people to listen to as much music as they could. So a big part of the equation for all these years was independent radio promotion. Independent promoters, no offense to my friends who worked in radio promotion, were basically the buffer between the labels and the radio stations because payola still existed all the way up through all these eras. So yes. the payola was when you used to pay radio stations yeah, to play, to your play record. records. So when they, when they made that illegal, they just had 
independent people that you would pay and they'd be the intermediary so it wouldn't be illegal. You didn't really know what they were doing with that money you sent them in a in an envelope. Once these stations were bought up, they were like, okay, well, who are we going to get to program these 150 stations that we bought? Oh, let's find one person to do that. This happened, actually. There was basically one guy that programmed m- almost all the rock stations and somebody that programmed all the alternative stations. I won't mention who they are. They were people that were paid by both the record label and the radio stations or the big companies to program these stations. And they would get a particular sum of money from every single station they got an ad on, even though the, mm. even though they were in control of the playlists. They're basically paying themselves to put the records on the air in a right. weird way. And in one, one case, one of the guys ended up becoming a manager of some of the bands. He would get paid because the bands would make money from radio airplay that he would get 20% of when he was Insane. the person that put them on the radio Insane. and decided how many spins they were getting a week. It doesn't quite seem like... A, you know that's uh, yeah should should be happening that that way. Well, and those of us who believe competition is good, this becomes a real problem because what you really have is the taste of one or two individuals yeah. determining what goes on the radio. Mm-hmm. So people start making their records and mixing them and mastering them in a way that they think might appeal to this person who controls all these radio stations. So I had people saying that they, when I was producing, people were looking for the next Nickelback. They just were. That was what people wanted because Mm. the people that, we're playing Nickelback, the guys that controlled the playlist. That was the standard, and that they were a band that was selling records, and people w- wanted that because the people, that was their taste. They liked Nickelback, so they played it. Here's a mm. real problem for me. So the stations are being controlled by people Nickelback who don't live in the market and don't so actually bad. have to listen Probably to what's still going in a lot out of over the air. So you get these records that are all mixed to sound the same, and if you start listening to a rock station in Detroit or Cleveland or Atlanta – for two hours, all the records, if they're playing new records, they all blur together. Well, first of all, a lot of them were produced by the same people and they were mixed by the same people. There was a handful of producers that produced all the rock records from you know the late 90s on until about 2012 when rock music completely died. They were not only produced by this handful of people, then there was a handful of mixers. When I say handful, I mean less Four. than five. <laughs> <laughs> So the records sound, sometimes you would listen to the radio and you'd hear 20 songs in a row that were all mixed by the same person. Insane. And they could have the same drum samples, the same, you know, th- everything, same bass sound, same type of compression things happening. Well, if you're doing your testing and for your radio station in your market, you're all of a sudden discovering that, wait, I have to play records that were made before 1995 to get people to not turn my station off. It wasn't a oh, the bands are all terrible situation. It was records don't sound in a, a very good on the radio anymore, so people are going to go back and play older records. Right. Mm. What was considered to be rock or alternative radio all of a sudden becomes this sort of hybrid. You get a one or two new records and a bunch of oldies. There's another layer that this is, this is really unbelievable. Jim and I were laughing about this thing. You also had these people called producer managers. Now, producer <laughs> managers started in the 80s, I think. But by the stupid. 90s, there were a few, a handful of producer managers that handled not only all the producers, but they also hand, handled recording engineers and mixing engineers. And then record label executives. So you could have a person that had the head of A&R for a major label was their client. So they would negotiate their contract with the record label and they would get a piece of their signing bonus or they would get 10% of their contract, whatever it would be. In addition, that A&R person would hire a producer that the manager also manages. And then they would hire a mixer that the producer manager Managers. The producer managers were making a percentage, 15%, I think it would be, of the producer's money, the per- people that produced the records. In addition to doing that, every producer that I worked with or that I knew at the time 
had their own gear. And why did they have their own gear? Because their producer managers told them to buy gear so they could rent it back to the bands so that the labels would pay for it. Let me wow. give you an idea of how these upcharges happen. This is another way that producers ridiculous. really the it's producer managers would make extra producer money. Producer managers. So I own stupid. this Marshall JCM 800. Right. This is an amp that we're yeah, going to use like for these. this session. Well, I'm going to rent it to the band for $100 a day, even though I bought this amp 30 years ago, because this is not part of the budget and this is part of my sound. So we're going to use it. As a matter of fact, we're also going to use this here. This is a an old Laney clip amp that people don't have. And I'm going to charge $100 a day for that too. You know what? My, J, my JCM 2000, that's going to be $75 a day. Oh, this high watt here? Yeah, this is $125 a day extra. So people would charge this, this like day after day after day, on top of the $2,000 to $2,500 a day that a studio would cost when you're making a record. And sometimes you're working for two, three, four months, five days a week, but you'd get a lockout, a seven-day-a-week lockout. So yeah, that'd be $14,000 a week just for the studio time. Ridiculous. And then when we use the Fully amps, ridiculous. add all those together, maybe it's $500, $600, $700 a day on top of that for the days that you use them. Let me give you another example. So it's this ridiculous. is, let's say, this comes with the studio. These are the mic pre's that are in the studio. These are BAE, Neve-type mic pre's. But that's not really my sound. My sound is my rack of mic pre's here, these Helios mic pre's. And this is what we're going to use. And since the studio doesn't have these, and I do, I'm going to charge the band a thousand bucks a day to use my Helios mic pre's. I might ridiculous. even charge more. So the studio time is two grand a day, but there's an extra upcharge here. No, that's ridiculous. And who does that go to? Well, the producer gets some of the money. Now, they've already owned this for 20 years or so, right? So they're just making money every single time. Because they can, but ultimately, it should come 15% with you. Percent of that is right? going to the producer. Like if manager, we're getting you, they're the ones that are encouraging the producer. That's to insane. Do that. that is like another thing stupid. that ate up money in the band's budget was the drum rental. They almost never producers almost never used the the uh, the drummer's drums. They would always rent them from a drum company. They would bring in a bunch of different drums in addition to a bunch of different snares, and then they would have a person that work for this drum company, tune the drums and change the heads every single day. There was a record that so I worked money. on that as in a band where the drum rental and the drum teching cost, I think about $25,000. That is so to change fucking the heads stupid. And tune the drums during the week. That is so that stupid. That's why drums. it doesn't now, happen like that anymore. Because it's right? so Renting stupid. Renting drums and things like that. That's but ridiculous. Producers like me, I owned all this stuff and I wouldn't rent the things to the band because ultimately the bands needed to recoup the money that they spent on the record from record sales. And me being the producer, I needed to recoup that money as well because I got my producer advance of $3,000 per song that I needed to recoup before I start getting paid any royalties. So this really didn't benefit anyone except, of course, these producer managers. And it just took the money from the labels as much as they could. This is an era when debut albums would have a $250,000 budget and they wanted to make sure they got as much of that budget as they could and leave less for the artist to live on. Right. But you're forgetting one other thing. Okay. The same rather smart producer managers said, hey, if you're going to hire my mixer to mix your single, he would get a point for mixing the single well, the single's the thing that's selling your CD. Wait, let's explain this one point. One point mm. is one percentage point. Yeah. When a band, a new band got signed back in those days, they would get 13%. That was their deal of of, of whatever the retail price of a record was. So if it was, uh, if a record may, cost 10 bucks or they made 10 bucks, the band would make $1.30 per record. Okay, so out of that, 13 points though they'd have to give the producer three points and the mixer one point because somebody these producer managers figured the mixer should also get a percentage point because if they were mixing the radio singles then that was selling the record so they should make that money so you mix one song but you get a point on the entire album right so then they decided to have them just mix the whole record yeah and mixing a record at that time so that they would charge you these mixing engineers would charge uh, money to rent their 3348 Sony machine. Then they would pay 
$2,000 a day for studio time, and then they get paid three to $5,000 per mix. That's just the mixing and part the, of it. And the people who were going along with this at the record companies shared a manager with the producers and the mixers. Right. This is why the producer managers would say that Rick Beato is not a team player. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and y- y'all think I'm being funny, but I've actually heard that language. Mm. I wasn't a very good team player either. Well, I just thought it was outrageous to be charging all these things. It is outrageous. What a lot of people didn't really understand at the time is that this made no difference to the record companies because it wasn't coming out of the record company's share of the sales. Mm -hmm. It was all coming out of the artist's share. Right. So all of this money, all of these extra charges are being recouped against the artist's royalties. Artists are paying for all of this. That's right. People were feeding at the trough together. And right. then the records all start yeah. to sound more alike and more alike and more alike. Yeah, well, in 1999, though, Napster happened. And then college kids were like, well, I'm not going to pay 19 bucks for a record. I can get this for free. And plus, there's only one good song in the record because the record labels would only focus on a few songs. They put most of the budget towards making those songs hit songs. And then the rest of the record was filler. I w- will ma- maintain forever that if records had sounded better, and there had been more variety, and there had been opportunities for more bands to break, Napster would have been a a blow, but it wouldn't have been fatal Mm. to the model of the record business. But the fact of the matter is that Napster uh, was the beginning of the end of that, of of the being able to make huge amounts of money for producers. Napster killed the $18.98 list price CD, which undermined that entire everybody getting paid to make the record model. Yes. And then budgets started going down. So in the 1990s, a, a, a typical record budget for a new band on a major label was about $250,000. Now, if you get a, if you, it sounds like a lot of money, but there were bands that had bidding wars that would have $750,000 budgets, two guaranteed records, $150,000 tour support, guaranteed videos. I made a few of those signings. Yeah. And by 2005, the idea that you would want to make a record with a budget of $75,000 was laughable. Mm. People said, what are you thinking? We we aren't going to spend that much money to make a record. So then what they started doing, labels started relying on people like myself. I could go in, I could co-write the songs with the bands. I could... Uh, yeah. I could play the parts. Just I wouldn't like have to hire session people because I could replay their parts if they needed Guys, it. Because exactly. almost that can play every it all. rock they record, can write it all. They can, you know, from the mid '90s on, yeah. would have a session drummer on it, even though there was a drummer in the band. Not everyone. Not everyone was Dave Grohl, but a lot of them they could have. They'd have a session drummer until Pro Tools happened, and once Pro Tools happened, and people started beat detecting, then you could have the crappy drummer of the band play. And you could fix, even though they would still hire session hey, people and use Beat Detective. I was once executive producer on an album that hired very expensive drummers and then ran them through Beat Detective. Right. I wasn't the producer on those tracks. But that was very common to hire session people to do it. Well, when there was no budget to hire session people, labels would say to me, okay, I've got, this is the budget I have. I got 50 grand. Can you make the whole record for that, including mixing it? <laughs> right? So... That's the catering budget on a record in 1998. <laughs> right. Stupid. Stupid. <laughs> Stupid. It's true. And then it was like, well, we don't have a budget. Well, then then it, eventually people just didn't get signed. There was just mm. no, no signing because rock music started to decline in popularity. I started doing sessions with no back-end royalties for just so I could get an extra 500 bucks per track. Yeah. Because it just, it all changed so much. It's- I mean, I always say that I started producing 10 years too late. If you had a million selling record, you'd make $300,000 as a producer yes. on it. If you had a, so if you had a multi-platinum record, something that sold 3 million records, you'd make a million dollars on as a mm. producer. Of course, your producer manager would take $150,000. <laughs> all those bands in the nineties from Pearl Jam, Stone Temple Pilots, Alice in Chains, Nirvana, yeah. Rage Against the Machine, all these things were all multi-platinum records. Soundgarden. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the people that produced those Huge. records, they made a lot of money from that. Yeah. Did. Was yep. it the copy of a copy of a copy thing that really killed rock music? That it wasn't just Nickelback. It was people trying to find the next Nickelbacks. A and R people well, were that, afraid to sign things that sounded original because every time they signed something, it, they're risking their job. Well, and they're risking their job because radio had changed so much that you couldn't go find a rogue promotion person to go to a rogue radio station to find out if your record was a hit. Right. Mm. So if I signed a band Mm -hmm. in 1993, 1994, there was a really good chance 
I could find out, I could get it on the radio somewhere and mm-hmm. test it and test yeah, it. Right. Yeah. And right. Right. If, right. Then you put some records in the stores in that market and people start buying them and you there can go, you go to another market and mm-hmm. say, Oh, this record's a hit in Chattanooga, Tennessee or Knoxville or Birmingham, Alabama. And that next radio station is more likely to give it a shot. And sometimes it took six months to build a hit record, but you could do it. They mm. would call record stores to see if things were selling. They would, they would, this was a common thing that radio stations would do research, record labels would do research. Look, we put it on, on the station here in Atlanta, Wax and Facts, Wax Tree, whatever record stores were here. You know, we're selling, you know, 20 records a day from, from you know, 10 spins that we had this week. All of us in the music industry were drunk off the catalog royalties from reissuing things on CD. There was so much money around in the early to mid 90s that people did, weren't really paying attention. There were a handful of people in the record industry who understood how devastating the Telecommunications Act could be. Mm-hmm. But most people just didn't see it coming at all. I have a radio promotion friend here, Randy, that's uh, who lives here in town. He was the one that told me way back then that that was the thing that was going to, that was basically killing the music industry. That whole FM radio underground, let's play what we like attitude, which still carried over into the 80s and 90s. There were still people running radio stations who came up that way, who were determined to keep that spirit alive. It was wiped out by the end of the century. I remember back when Urban Hymns by The Verve came out and Bittersweet Symphony was a single and the DJ at 99X played it eight times in a row. He's like, that was amazing. I'm going to play it again during drive time. <laughs> I, I can't believe that song. That just kills me. I'm going to play it again. I'm going to play it again eight times in a row. Now, that would never happen. And that was that's because it was not owned by one of mm. these big corporations. Well, we both have friends who were DJs who by the early 2000s, there was no creativity left in the job for them. They were told what to play. At best, you would get a choice between two or three records, and you had to play the same kind of record in the same part of the hour during the day. It was all allegedly scientific right. about what would get people to listen to the radio more. Yeah, and Formulaic, all of that, all that stuff. Yeah. Research basically destroyed what made people love radio in the first place. Mm. So, Jim, mm-hmm. what's next? Yeah. Can rock music ever become popular like it was, or, or is that just something that's that's gone. I look at rock music as having sort of two two things that I really love about all kinds of music, but rock in particular. One is the freedom for creativity. And one thing that's been wonderful in the last decade is young artists who have no prayer, no hope, no thought of ever getting played on the radio have had the freedom to be creative in ways that it's a really nice time to go out and listen to music. But what's missing for you and for me is the collective experience of everybody enjoying a record together. Right. And I hope you have some ideas. This is a really frustrating thing for me to think about. Well, just to 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 that point, when when you're saying enjoy it together, that collective experience, artists, whether it was, you know, bands like Nirvana or Pearl Jam or all the bands in the early nineties that were huge, they were worldwide bands. They were famous everywhere. And that's really when rock ruled. That was the last time that rock kind of ruled. Linkin Park was, I think, was probably famous worldwide, right? But a lot of the other bands mm-hmm. from that new metal era were not. And there was mm-hmm. a real split. People in England weren't listening to new metal records necessarily. They listened to Linkin Park, but I might be wrong about that. Am I wrong, Jim? I think they did. I just don't think it had the same urgency. The notion that everyone's Mm. talking about an artist is something that I think people miss. Um, For Taylor Swift being the biggest artist in the world, I think she's the biggest cult artist who's ever existed because I know dozens of people who care a lot about music who claim to have never heard a note of her songs. I do too. Imagine people saying that about Led Zeppelin or the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or Joni Mitchell. Or Michael Jackson or whoever. What's good news if you're a musician is you can find a passionate art fan base. You can pursue your art. There are people who are figuring out ways to make money being artists. What we were going to miss forever is the sense that everybody in the world has to talk about this record on this particular day. Right. 
was there's that so a function? There's so much to talk about. There's, there's so many other radio. options. It was radio. Now, I know a lot of know, music fans. People's attention. I know people who are hyper engaged all over the by place. music. I love to talk to them. Um, we should embrace what we have with that. But I miss it. Yeah. You miss it. We talk yeah. about this a lot. This is an ongoing conversation between me and Rick. And I think this is a little window into what's been a hundred hours of talking right. about this between us. <laughs> I wanted to capture this, one of our conversations here about this topic and, and uh, this will probably go on, go on forever. But uh, Jim, I really appreciate you being here today and uh, check out Jim's Substack. I'll put the link in the description. And I'm working on an interesting project, which Rick has yes. been seeing a preview of it's, full body motion capture live performances by musicians. It's going to be available through an app on the MetaQuest in about three months. We'll put a link so you can sign up for information from Soapbox. That's the company. It's, it's amazing. And it's real creativity. And it's a, an attempt to bring music to a wider audience in the, in the post-radio era. Post-radio era. Jim, thanks. Appreciate Rick, it. It's always All right. fun. All right. There it is. There it is. All right. That was interesting. That was interesting to hear, you know. It's always interesting to hear old guy stories. <laughs> sometimes it's boring, sometimes it's repetitive. <laughs> All of that, right? Yeah, producer managers. I think I've heard Rick Beato talk about producer managers before. What a stupid name. Producer managers. Ridiculous. Anyways, it's all a racket. You know, that's the thing. It's all it's all a racket, like an enabling racket. You hear it. You hear it. Yeah. Music is it's just different now. You know, these are just, you know. And I get it. You can talk about how things used to be and, uh, you know, the good old days, stuff like that. There's a bit of that here for sure. You know, like two old guys talking about the good old days, you know, and how we wish it was still the good old days. And it just doesn't work like that. They know that they're not. These people are not stupid, but the thing that gets me is just the amount of waste. The amount of waste is obscene, like obscene. There is no reason to be spending that much money on certain things in certain areas to make a record or to tour or to do some of these things, you know. It it just doesn't make sense. Such a waste. You can you can make a leaner machine and everybody is going to benefit from that because it's more money in all these people's pockets. But again, they don't care because they're just putting the bill on the artist. It's like, who's advocating for the artist? It, the artist is, is the artist even advocating for themselves? What what's you know, what is it? What is it? It's it's. It's too much. It's too much. It's really wild. So, but it's this thing. How he was saying, like, Rick, you're not, you're not, I forget how he put it. Rick, you're not playing along, or Rick, Rick is not easy to work with, or 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 uh whatever, because he wasn't going along with the whole system, scheme, whatever you want to call it. I would absolutely be the same way. Absolutely. I mean, anybody that knows me that has been on the channel long enough knows that I would not. <laughs> it's like, Rick, you're not playing along. It's like, yeah, no, if I think it's stupid, I'm not playing along. Like, wait a minute. What? This is ridiculous. This is totally silly. I think that's a big deal. I think it's very interesting that they went from $250,000 for a record to $75,000 for a record is ridiculous in such a short amount of time in four or five years it's really a small amount of time i mean i was in college at the beginning of napster at the beginning of all of that i should have known that <laughs> but you know uh you know you're you're into all these other things and you're at college and, and all that's exciting and all that you know it's you're not specifically paying attention to those things because you're just living your life anyways as I've been saying, there's always going to be music. There's always going to be rock music. There's always going to be other styles of music and artists and bands and things like that. It, it It's just things change. And when things change, some 
people, some group, some whatever, however you want to put it, don't adapt and they get left behind, so to speak. And new bands, groups, artists, whatever, are able to come out of that because that's their thing. They, you know, maybe they put more attention into that or their beginning and they just went straight to that because they saw, you know, all that kind of thing. There's just like a new wave, basically. That's just how it, it is. That's how it is. That's how it's always been. That's going to keep happening. That's going to keep happening. But there's always going to be music. In all shapes and forms and styles and types and in new ways and shapes and forms and styles and types that we don't even know yet. It's just going to be a thing. It's It's what it is. Corruption and how corruption and greed led to the downfall of rock music. I mean, at least of that era of rock music. Yes, that era of rock music. You know, he said 2012 when rock music really died. I'm like, did it really die in 2012? I just don't see it that way. All right. New rock bands. Dirty Honey. I actually know a couple of people in that band. Greta Van Fleet. I mean, yeah, right? They're a newer rock band. I mean, yeah, sure, they sound like Zeppelin or whatever. At least that's how they started. But, I mean, they are a newer rock band, and they are doing things and playing venues and, you know, big venues and all that. Wow, Crownlands. Look at them. Our buddies, our Canadian buddies, Crownlands. Beaver 333. Yeah. Is is Thomas Bridget in this band? I know that he's played for them. They're out of Oakland, I'm pretty sure. Spirit Box, I've heard of them. I mean, I've heard of some of these groups, but mm, no way should I perform all of them. Yeah, Arctic Monkeys, they're not newer, though. Black Keys, they're not newer. This is from 2022. Rock Isn't Dead, 15 rising rock bands and solo acts you should know. Here we go. The Struts, yeah, Dirty Honey. Tyler Bryant, yeah, he's a great guitar player. Crownlands, look at them. Band Inc., Urban House, the LA Maybe. I've never heard of those guys. ACDC Grinds in the Verses in 1989, Dial MTV Hooks and Chorus. Naked Gypsy Queens, Flush. Native Sons, I've heard of them. Aaron Jones, River Ghost, Quaker City Nighthawks, 53 Judges, Thunder Mother, Cold Stairs, The Black Moods. Jack's Hollow. Point being, these are all bands, new bands, newer bands for you to check out. There's always going to be. Always. Always. There's always going to be. That's just my opinion. It's just, there's a new way of doing things. And there's a new way that they need to figure out how to get themselves out there. And that is not the same as the old way. It just isn't. It it just never works that way. This definitely is more of a, you know, old guys on the couch talking about the good times type of thing. So I don't think it's dead. I don't think it's dead. Yes, it's changed. Yes, it's different. I don't think it's dead. I think that's being dramatic. But, you know, you got to make a title and make it dramatic in order for people to click on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there it is. Cool. Yep. Awesome. Thank you guys. I'll catch you next video later.